start under the star. It's pitch black and we each have a, a, a torch headlamp uh, on our heads for where we can see where we're going. Now I look up and I see this dotted trail of other trekkers and their lamps. And I start, start trudging up. And I have to go somewhere. So I actually go off to the side, do what I have to do, to come back. And Mark's going, Granny, where the hell have you been? We've been looking for you. We had to go. <laughs> Mark and Kim Bryant were two people who stayed with me, trying to support me in my weary state to make this. But I'm supposed to climb 1,165 metres over the next seven hours. You know where I should be? I should be in bed. That's right. That's where I should be. But I have a dream and this is what I want to achieve. Then comes walking down past me is a young girl. She's crying. She's escorted by a guy. My guy beside me, he turns and says, ah, Alfie, she's sick. I just reached a new low of despair. The thought of being able to stand on top of Kilimanjaro on the summit at, at sunrise, it just seemed out of reach. So I turned to a little bit of inspiration. It's from the true story I saw with mum and dad in 2003. And my hero story, it begins like this. The first time he saw Seabiscuit, the colt was walking through the fog at five in the morning. Smith would say later that the horse looked right through him, as if to say, what the hell are you looking at? Who do you think you are? He was a small horse, barely 15 hands. He was hurting too. There was a limp in his walk, a wheezing when he breathed. Smith didn't pay attention to that. He was looking the horse in the eye. God damn. He was the son of Hardtack, sired by the mighty man of war, but the breeding did little to impress anyone at Claiborne Farms. Get rid of him. At six months, he was shipped off to train with the legendary trainer, Sonny Fitzsimmons, who, over time, developed a similar opinion of the colt. Is that a race horse or a lead pony? They made him a training partner to better horses, forcing him to lose head-to-head -head duels to boost the confidence of the other animal. By the time he was three years old, Seabiscuit was struggling in two cheap claiming races a week. Soon he grew as bitter and angry as his sire Hardtack had been. He was sold for the rock bottom price of $2,000. And of course, it all made sense. Champions were large. They were sleek. They were without imperfection. When they finally did race him, he did just what they had trained him to do. He lost. Seabiscuit was small, odd looking, and the experts thought him broken. When I saw this film in 2003, that's exactly how I felt, broken. But Seabiscuit's story does not end there. An unorthodox trainer, this man right here, he saw something that others didn't. Potential. With an unlikely trio, this man being one who was a Mustang breaker, a refugee from the uh, Vanishing West, trainer Tom Smith. And then there was the owner, Charles Howard, a man who went from bicycle repairman to car dealership owner to self-made millionaire. And the third figure, 
It was a tragic figure. As a young boy, he was abandoned at a makeshift uh, race track for horses that was cut out of the field. And he made his way through life as a part-time prize fighter and a failing jockey. But they did something that others didn't do. They would not give up on Sea Biscuit. And fortunately, in my life, I have two people not giving up on me. And you know who they are. So under this unlikely trio, what did Seabiscuit do? He stunned the world. He was the first horse to earn over 400,000 US dollars. That's $6.5 million today. He became a national celebrity. And in 1938, the number one newsmaker, which is judged by the number of articles written about them, not President Roosevelt, not Mussolini, not Hitler, little odd-looking, broken sea biscuit. But there was a challenge. It was called the match of the century. It was a match race with sea biscuit and one other horse. This other horse, it had won, it was a triple crown winner, it had won the three most prestigious races in the United States and it was the fourth horse in history only to ever do this. It was a giant, perfect, beautiful horse. Its name, War Admiral. The Admiral was favoured by the bookies, one to four, and as well as just about all the riders and tipsters. The race was to be run over one and three sixteenths of a mile, 1.91 kilometres. The race, they didn't use starting gates. It was a walk-up start. And they started the race with an alarm bell. They're off. There's rating. There's 40,000 people watching, including in the infield. So many people want to see it. Around the United States, 40 million people listening over the radio. It stopped the nation. It was equivalent to the Super Bowl. Somebody very special takes a moment out of their hectic schedule to ensure that they're listening in. President Roosevelt. The outcome? Seabiscuit did not win. Seabiscuit did not win by one horse length. Did not win by two. Did not win by three. He won by four horse lengths and broke the track record despite War Admiral running his best time over this distance. I find Seabiscuit very, very inspiring. It really touched me and it made an indelible mark because I learned about his story at a time in my life which was very, very dark and uh, I was feeling very broken but I had two people in my corner not giving up on me. I have a question for you. If you were in a difficult situation, having a problem, or facing real adversity, if you could speak to anyone for a little bit of inspiration and advice from history, anybody at all, who would it be? So I want you to pick somebody in your mind who that would, would be. They can be alive, they can be famous, they can even be unknown. So please, just cast your mind for a moment and pick somebody. They can be a friend or relative. Plenty of amazing people out there. Nelson Mandela, Steve Jobs, Caesar, Alexander the Great, Richard Branson, Mahatma Gandhi. This side of the audience, do you have somebody in mind? Have you selected somebody? Most people selected somebody? How about here? Have we selected somebody? Got somebody in mind? We have somebody in mind from history that you'd like to go back? Okay. Who chose somebody who was alive? Okay, we've got quite a few alive. Who chose somebody famous? Famous? Got a lot of famous ones. 
Who chose a friend or a relative? Yes, there's some amazing people in our lives. That's great. Who chose a female? Wow, that's good to see. There is an amazing number, incredible. Elizabeth the Great, J.K. Rowling, um, um, Shosho Cannell. And I'm pleased to say, you all did a lot better than me. Because if I was talking to my inspiration, I'd be speaking to a horse. However, I have read the best-selling book on Seabiscuit by Laura Hildebrand. And I learned, when Seabiscuit started to win, what did they do, the little fella? They loaded him up with whey. He started to win some more, we loaded him up some whey. But Seabiscuit had a secret. But I'll let somebody who was around that time tell you what that was. Here's a horse that's been laid up a year. You don't know what kind of a horse he, he's going to be, and they still put 130 pounds on him. That's one of the great things about Seabiscuit, really. You, you know, he carried that 130 pounds like you and I carry an envelope or something. <laughs> he carries that 130 pounds like you and I carry an envelope. His secret was Seabiscuit was a great weight carrier. That was his secret. So... As I've looked up Kilimanjaro this night and I've hit a really despairing moment of the time, that, you know, am I going to pack this, pack this in? I thought of Seabiscuit. And I said to myself over and over, Seabiscuit is a great weight carrier, so am I. And with that inspiration, I was able to put one foot in front of the other and continue trudging up that mountain. Well, of course, it's actually amazing. We all hit hurdles in life, but with a small bit of inspiration, it's amazing how far you can go. Me, Seabiscuit helped me tap my resilience and climb a mountain. Triumph. Greatest physical feat I've ever done in my life.